welcome back. Today we are going to talk about injections. Uh, we're going to talk about using injectables. We're going to talk about uh, sharps containers and safety with sharps. Um, nurses uh, use needles and syringes and sharps containers uh, in the clinical setting every day and it is very important that we handle them to prevent needle sticks. Um, there are different types of needle sticks. You can be um, uh, accidentally get a clean needle stick, which means you've stuck yourself with a needle while you're preparing a medication before you've taken that medication uh, and that needle to the patient's room. That's a clean stick. Uh, you can also get a dirty needle stick, which means that you stick yourself with a needle after you've injected that needle into the patient. Um, and we want to try to prevent needle sticks of any sort from taking place. So we're going to spend a little bit of time today learning about safety. Okay, first things first. We never want to overfill a sharps container. If we overfill it past the line where it says it's full, you can see it on this uh, picture here. Uh, there's a tendency for the sharps to stick out of the container, meaning that if I go to throw something in it, I probably get stuck by a dirty needle that's sticking out of the container. So number one rule, do not overfill sharps containers. Always wear gloves. Okay, we always want to wear gloves when we are handling sharps. Um, that's very important. Never recap a dirty needle, which is a used needle, okay? Now, it is okay to recap a needle after you have drawn up the medication and are preparing to carry it to inject the patient, okay? So what I mean by that is I'm at the med cart, I'm preparing a medication, I draw up the medication, and now I'm going to the patient's room. Well, I'm not gonna walk through the hallway with an exposed needle. So you can see in this picture down at the bottom, I am recapping the needle. I'm going ahead and scooping it up to recap it and walk down to my patient's room. If you have gone to the patient's room now, you've taken that needle cover off, you've injected the patient, we never ever recap that needle because now it's a dirty needle, okay? So the, that's very important for you to, to distinguish uh, the difference. So the rule of thumb is never recap a dirty or used needle. Um, but how to safely recap a needle um, for use to take it after you've prepared it and walk down the hallway. Um, this is one method where you can place the cap on a flat surface, okay? And then uh, take your hand away from the cap so that you don't stick yourself. Um, you then want to take your hand with the syringe in it and use um, a scooping motion, right? So just scoop up the cap. Uh, then when the cap covers the needle completely, uh, we can use the other hand to kind of secure the cap onto the needle. Um, and this will uh, prevent us from uh, sticking ourselves, okay? There are other ways to safely recap a needle, which you'll be learning about in lab. My favorite is this technique uh, in this photographs that you see here. So let's talk about the safety glide. Um, after injecting the patient with the needle, we can, with our finger, activate the safety glide. So here you see the safety glide in the position that it's in um, when we are preparing the med and giving the injection. In the picture up, uh, um, up on the right where you see the finger sliding that safety glide over the needle, that is what we will do after we have given the injection um, before we throw the needle into our sharps container. Okay, um, safety glide is a feature that's on many of the needles that we use nowadays in the clinical setting. It's going to be on the needles that you're gonna be using in lab. 
So we want to activate the safety glide after injection to prevent needle sticks. And so when you're first learning, um, you're kind of nervous, you're injecting the patient. Um, it's, it's hard to remember once you, once you inject them and you pull that uh, syringe back out to say to yourself, all right, I got to stop right now. I have to activate the safety glide and then go straight to my sharps con container. But that is absolutely the sequence of events that you need to do every time for safety purposes. So we want to take that used needle, that, that dirty needle, directly to our sharps container. And we want to activate, activate that safety glide first um, to prevent needle sticks. Okay? So in um, the beginning of this lecture, I think it's most important for us to go ahead and label the parts of our syringe. So we have a plunger, you see there. Uh, where we draw the medication up into is referred to as the barrel. Um, we have a plain tip, we have a needle hub, we have our needle, and our needle is beveled at the end. And so here we can see um, the lumen of the needle uh, is beveled, and there are some injections that we give where we say that the bevel must be up. And so you can see here what we mean by bevel facing upwards. Uh, we also have a needle cap, uh, which we just talked about a little bit ago. Um, some needles have uh, needle caps uh, for, for safety purposes. We can recap the needle on our way to go give an in injection. This particular needle does not have a safety glide on it. You can see that. Some needles do have them and some needles do not. So needles 101. So when selecting a needle for injection, you must consider two things, the gauge of the needle and the length of the needle. So first consider the size of the patient and the type of injection that you're going to give. So when we're looking at needle gauge, we're talking about the circumference of the opening of the needle. And you can see here that an 18 gauge needle has quite a large circumference and a 25 gauge needle has a much smaller opening. So a smaller gauge actually means a larger bore. And I know that this is kind of confusing, but that's just how it is. So you're going to have to learn. Uh, so for example, a 14 gauge needle has a much larger bore than a 23 gauge needle. All right. Um, so generally speaking, if I'm going to give someone an IM injection, an intramuscular injection, I'm going to want to do it with a 23 gauge needle, okay? If you come at me to give me an injection with a 14 gauge needle, I'm going to run because that is a very large bore, okay? All right. So when we talk about intramuscular injections, what we're saying is that we're giving that medication through the skin, through the subcutaneous tissue, and actually into the muscle, right? Um, and you can see uh, gentle traction is, is, is made on the skin um, in order to um, then go ahead and dart your syringe in very quickly. Believe it or not, injecting quicker is less pain. Nothing uh, is more difficult for me to watch than a student very slowly sticking a needle into a patient. You want to have a, a good control of that needle. You want to move it quickly through the skin and into the muscle and then to inject that medication uh, into the muscle. So uh, in terms of needle length, here you can see we probably need a longer needle, right, to get through the skin and the subcutaneous tissue into the muscle. So we can see some examples here, and these are the examples that you're going to be working with in lab. We see a 23 gauge needle, okay, that's a small bore uh, at, with a one inch in length. 
right? This would be an IM injection that we might give into a muscle like the deltoid. One inch is a good length for a deltoid injection. A deeper intramuscular injection, um, we might use a one and a half inch needle. Um, and over on the other side there, we can see a subcutaneous um, uh, needle for a fat tissue uh, would be an example like uh, injecting insulin into a patient's abdomen um, would, would be a very short needle um, because we're trying to go into the subcutaneous tissue. Um, and a subcutaneous tissue is closer to the skin than the muscle, which is deeper in the skin, okay? And so uh, for an intramuscular injection, we're gonna go deeper into the tissue than a subcutaneous injection, okay? So we're gonna need a longer needle for an IM injection. So in administering an intramuscular injection, we want to use our non-dominant hand to stretch the skin tightly where we will insert the needle. So grasping the syringe in a dart-like fashion, inserting the entire needle with one swift movement is the goal. And we wanna insert directly into the muscle at a 90 degree angle. And so here we can see an example of the deltoid muscle being injection. Uh, being injected. Um, the landmark that we want to use is two finger breaths uh, down from the acromion process. And um, that is where then in the triangle space, uh, we will inject uh, our medication. Uh, a lot of immunizations are given in the deltoid muscle. Okay. So uh, you have with you for lab, uh, a 23 gauge, one inch needle for uh, injection into the deltoid muscle, okay? It's important to look at the packaging to see what type of needle you have to, to work with. Um, it's also important to open up packages of needles and look at different sizes of length and gauge so that you can get a, a basic understanding. Um, we have other intramuscular injection sites, um, including the ventral gluteal site and the gluteus medius muscle. We also have the dorsal gluteal injection site in our gluteus maximus muscle. Um, but what we want to be careful about is the location of the sciatic nerve. Okay, so we want to avoid <clears throat> the sciatic nerve by injecting in the ventral gluteal or the upper gluteus maximus, which is the dorsal gluteal site. Um, so when you're, when you're looking um, at this other image, this kind of helps us see again where the gluteus medius uh, muscle is, the gluteus maximal muscus muscle is, and then kind of our green zone, which is our safe area um, for giving uh, this type of IM injection. And so for landmarking uh, for ventrogluteal muscle, uh, we want to use the anterior superior iliac spine, and we want uh, to put our, our fingers um, on the anterior superior iliac spine, uh, um, we want our palm to be on the greater trochanter. And we can kind of feel those bony prominences sticking through for our landmarks. We want to make sure that our thumb is pointing towards our patient's pelvis, um, that our patient is kind of, um, kind of positioned onto their side. And then we want to... Uh, open these two fingers up and know that our injection goes into that gluteus uh, medius muscle right there in that uh, sweet spot. So we want to aim our thumb towards the pelvis, place our index finger on the front or the anterior superior iliac spine. So you have um, probably each other to, to find these landmarks on. You may have a mannequin there to practice on as well. Uh, the dorsogluteal muscle um, is really used for larger uh, volume, deeper IM injections or irritating medications. 
Um, again, there is a risk for danger uh, uh, to the damaging, the sciatic nerve. So we want to carefully uh, observe for landmarks to ensure a proper placement. And so um, if we look at an example here, um, we would say that a longer needle is definitely needed for one of these deeper IM injections. And so you can see again um, here where your packaging will tell you, you have a 22 gauge, that's a pretty small bore, but you have a one and a half inch needle for a deeper injection. And you can kind of see here where our safe spot would be um, if we were doing the injection um, in, in either the dorsal gluteal or the ventral gluteal um, area. The vastus lateralis muscle is another muscle that we use uh, as an injection site. This uh, muscle is particularly well developed in babies and children. And so this is usually uh, a preferred site for um, IM injections in, in kids. And uh, we can see where that vastus lateralis muscle is located. Um, in that lateral view of the right thigh. And actually, uh, there's also the rectus femoris uh, injection site. Uh, the vastus lateralis is uh, the preferred. And again, the landmarks are the greater trochanter and the lateral condyle. Um, and we kind of want to um, locate those two landmarks and we want to kind of identify in that middle um, third uh, uh, section where that vastus lateralis muscle lies, okay? So those are some of the landmarkings that you need to be practicing um, in order to give IM injections. Um, there is definitely going to be board questions on how you landmark um, for these various types of um, I am injection. So please make sure you practice, make sure you study. Um, in a subcutaneous injection, uh, we usually go in at a 45 degree angle, right? Because we're trying to um, inject medication, maybe insulin into the subcutaneous tissue. We said that an IM injection usually goes in at a 90 degree angle, and here we're looking at a subcutaneous injection going in at a 45 degree angle, okay? Um, and so if we look at an insulin syringe, again, we have uh, our parts labeled, our plunger, our barrel, we can see our needle and our needle cap. Each unit of insulin um, is calibrated um, by one um, small line. And so when we are drawing up insulin, we must be very careful that we're drawing the correct amount, okay? And insulin is measured in units. So here we can see some sizes of our insulin syringes. Uh, the two most common here um, are circled in red. That is our 1 ml insulin syringe, which holds 100 units. We can also see uh, our 50 unit insulin syringe, um, which it, it also holds 0.5 mLs. Uh, also, uh, that will be referred to as a half mL syringe, okay? So we have a half mL or 0.5 mL, and we have a one mL. Here is another view of those types of insulin syringes. Um, we can see the 0.5 mL syringe um, starts uh, with the, the largest number measuring at five uh, units, um, but you can, you can pull up as much as one unit um, in that syringe. And then we can see also our 100 unit syringe or our 1 mL syringe, which would be used for drawing up larger uh, amounts of insulin, okay? Sometimes when you're in a clinical setting, you don't have much of an option. You might only have a 1 ml syringe, that's okay, um, but you just need to be aware of the different sizes and you need to be aware of carefully drawing up the correct amount. So for insulin injection sites, 
Uh, we can see them here. Uh, we want to inject into subcutaneous tissue, either on the uh, outer arm, so that's this kind of flabbier area back here, uh, the abdomen. Um, it mentions our buttocks and our upper and outer thighs, not used as frequently. Um, mostly we use the outer arm and the abdomen. It's very important to rotate the injection sites because we are um, injecting insulin uh, frequently uh, for uh, diabetics and we want to make sure that we aren't injecting into the same site over and over again. Um, pinching the skin to give an insulin injection uh, with, with the, um, just very gently um, is, is fine um, in order then to dart in that very, very small um, needle. It has a small gauge and also um, a pretty small length um, to get into that subcutaneous tissue at that 45 um, degree angle. Uh, here we can see some damage that could occur um, if you inject insulin into the same site over and over without rotating the injection sites, okay? Um, some kind of like scarring uh, of the skin there, okay? That's why we rotate injection sites. Um, intradermal injections are a yet another type of injection that we give. Um, we give these with TB syringes. An example of this would be when we um, do a TB test and we uh, inject into the forearm uh, a very, very uh, sh uh, shallow, right underneath the skin. We inject the uh, TB uh, purified protein, the tuberculin purified protein derivative. We inject that into that uh, inner surface of that uh, forearm and the amount that we inject is 0.1 ml, okay? Uh, the injection should be made with the tuberculin syringe uh, with the needle bevel facing upwards. So we learned a little bit about that earlier in this lecture. So here we see an intradermal bleb um, for a TB skin test uh, that the nurse is uh, making this, this little bleb uh, on the forearm to be read uh, within uh, a 72 hour period. So a TB syringe also has a safety glide on it. We want to activate that safety glide and right after uh, we give that injection, right? So that we can make sure we activate the safety glide, go straight into our sharps container um, to avoid any type of needle stick. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the difference between a blunt fill needle uh, and a filter needle. So a blunt fill needle, which you will be working with in lab, is used to draw up medications that are viscous. Um, or, or thick, thick medications, think of it that way. Um, the nurse must change the blunt fill needle after drawing up the medication because the blunt fill needle usually has a very large bore, okay? More like, uh, you know, a 16 gauge um, or a 14 gauge. So the correct size needle must be selected for the type of injection that you're going to give to the patient, right? So we wanna change out that big, huge, like large bore uh, 14 gauge needle with our smaller gauge, maybe 23 gauge, one inch needle, if we're gonna give our patient a deltoid uh, muscle injection. So we can see here that blunt fill needles sometimes have filters on them, okay? So you've got to look at the box. You have to look at the packaging to see whether or not the blunt fill needle, needle has a filter. Um, if it does not have a filter, um, that's okay, right? You can use your blunt fill needles to draw medications and switch out your needles uh, before injecting the patient all day long, okay? Uh, that's what they're for. They're for quickly drawing up medications. 
Um, but however, you need to know uh, if you need to use a filter needle in a very specific situation. And we're going to look at that situation right now. Here you can see you've got a filter needle um, uh, packaging. Uh, it says it's a 19 gauge one and one half inch size needle. On the packaging below, you can see that you've got a blunt film needle also with a filter. It's an 18 gauge um, one and one half inch needle. Um, so I'm showing this to you so that you can see that different packages will have um, different coloring even on the packaging. Um, and so when we use a filter needle is when we're drawing medication out of an ampule. All right, and that is because when we are drawing medication out of an ampule, we must break the neck off of the ampule. And that means that there are shards of glass that could be around even in the medication even that we just broke the neck off of. And so here you can see um, a syringe, a needle going into um, an ampule where the neck has been broken off. You can see a close up where there, are, there is broken glass there. And it's really important that we use a filter needle when we're working with a glass ampule. Because what it will do is it will filter out any shards of glass that might be in of that broken ampule, okay? And so we want to make sure that we're using a blunt film needle with a filter uh, to, to filter out the small particles of glass from an ampule, okay? Um, so the takeaway from this part is just to really know that a blunt fill and a filter needle are not the same. And actually after we um, a, a blunt fill needle does not filter out glass when drawing from a glass ampule, okay? Um, and I wanna go back to this slide um, and just kind of, kind of finish this out. Um, when you uh, draw medication out of an ampule with your filter needle, okay, you are then, again, going to change out the needle. So you're gonna take that filter needle off you're gonna throw that into the sharps container, all right? And then you're gonna replace it with the correct size, gauge, and length for the needle that you need to be giving for the type of injection that you're going to be giving to the patient. I hope this was helpful. I hope uh, you can remember some of these important clinical pearls when you're in the clinical setting with your instructor. Uh, and until next time, aloha.